Okay. Oh, somebody's already started recording. Okay, great. Perfect. So I'm going to turn off the camera. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, we are really uh, glad that you could join us today and very excited to welcome you to the virtual Faculty of Information Info Day. Um, and again, we are going to start off the day with some admissions and career information. And then at 1145, our student ambassador, Nicole, will lead you on a virtual uh, campus tour if you're interested in uh, participating in that event. Um, and then throughout the day, um, so through using the event link um, to enter today's session, we have a lot of different other um, a lot of other resources available for you. So videos and of past info days um, and introductions to um, you know the iSchool um, and we have different brochures for you to browse. Um, so make sure that you enter the, the different booths available within the virtual events platform um, to look at some of the other information that is available to you. Okay, and just to start off with, um, an acknowledgement of traditional land. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this is the meeting place, um, sorry, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. That's me, <laughs> again, the admissions and recruitment officer. Okay, so admissions. Applications are now open and they are available on the School of Graduate Studies website. So apply.sgs.utoronto.ca is where you're going to find the online application. You should apply by January 31st if you would like to be automatically considered for any entrance awards and scholarships. Um, these admissions awards and scholarships are highly competitive. So we do require a minimum A minus average to be considered for them. And all your application materials, including the receipt of your letters of recommendation, uh, do need to be received by January 31st. The regular admissions deadline is March 31st, and the deadline for your supporting documents is April 15th. That being said, I do not recommend waiting until the final deadline to apply, as we do admit on a rolling basis, and the program may become full by the time your application is received. So the sooner you apply, the sooner you will receive a decision. So what are we looking for um, to include in your application? So we do accept students from all academic backgrounds into our program. So we have students with a background in social sciences, humanities, computer science, engineering, finance, history, English, and so on. For the GPA, we are looking for about a B plus average, and we calculate that in two ways. So we either take your CGPA, your cumulative GPA over your four years um, of your bachelor's degree, or your final year average, and we take whichever the two is highest. So the final year average is not necessarily the courses you've completed in your last year of study. We're gonna take your most recent third and fourth year, so senior level courses, and count back until we have a year's worth um, to calculate the final year average. We do look at files on a holistic basis. So we do consider the entire application equally. Your GPA, your resume, references, statement, um, when making a decision. So if your GPA is slightly below B plus, I would still encourage you to apply uh, to the program and you can chat with me um, individually if you do have any specific uh, questions about your specific situation. For transcripts, at the time of the application, we only ask for your unofficial transcript to make a decision. And you're going to upload copies of all of your post-secondary transcripts to your online, um, online applicant portal. And then if you're offered admission, the offer will be conditional upon receiving an official copy of your transcripts. And in order for a transcript to be considered official, it must be sent to the Faculty of Information directly from your institution in a sealed, unopened envelope. And this will be due by the end of August. References, um, as soon as you save the referee information to your applicant profile and pay the application fee, the School of Graduate Studies will automatically send your referees a fillable referee form to complete and this automatically gets uploaded to your applicant file. And we do require two academic references for admission consideration. 
You are able to provide a third optional reference if you wish, which could be academic or professional, um, but only consider adding an additional reference if you are certain that it will be as strong as your other required references. And if you last graduated more than five years ago, you may substitute professional letters of reference instead. However, if you are submitting professional references, do let your referees know that they should focus on skills that are relevant within a graduate level program. And this will include uh, skills such as your critical thinking, problem solving, research, writing, and your communication skills. Then we're looking for an academic resume or CV. And you're going to want to include information um, such as your educational background, any relevant personal or work experience, both paid and unpaid, any publications that you may have written um, or professional activities that you're involved in, so committees or associations, um, any awards, honors, grants or fellowships that you might have received, anything that you want us to know about you that maybe you were not able to include in any other part of your application. The English proficiency score, um, this is for applicants where English is not their first language. Um, you may have to provide a uh, English proficiency test result. If you have completed an undergraduate or a graduate degree from an institution where English is used as the medium of instruction and examination, then an English proficiency test uh, may not be required. However, you will be required to provide a letter from your institution verifying that English is used as the medium of instruction and examination. Now, I want to get a little bit more um, into detail about our statement of intent. So as a future participant in the museum field, you will be responsible for the management of information, knowledge, and culture in an ever-changing world. And it is important to the Faculty of Information that we are educating and empowering museum professionals that are and will be grounded in the values of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So we encourage you to reflect on these concepts as you prepare your application. And to get a sense of the qualities that we're looking for in an applicant, the main themes of these questions um, that you're required to answer as part of your statement of intent demonstrate the qualities that the faculty of information feel are important in a potential candidate. So for example, in the first part of your essay, we would like to learn more about your vision for graduate studies and subsequent professional career. So what made you to decide uh, to apply to the faculty of information? How do your academic, professional, or personal experiences um, and future aspirations align with our museum studies program? Or what topics, problems, or questions would you like to explore during your studies? What are your career goals? Upon graduation, how do you see yourself contributing to the museum industry? Or what does it mean to you to be a museum professional? In this part, you might also want to include um, any discrepancies in your um, undergraduate or your bachelor's degree transcript, if there are any. Um, and, and you can provide a very, very brief explanation um, for any of those discrepancies within your uh, transcript. So if you're, there was a course that maybe you didn't do so well in and, and you wanted to explain that, you can do that here as well. Again, very, very briefly. In the second part, you will select one of four questions to respond to, and they surround various themes, such as teamwork, equity, diversity, and inclusion, coping with change, and managing multiple priorities. We hope to better understand your interpersonal skills and self-reflective capabilities. And here you should feel free to provide examples from your personal, professional, and academic experiences. Responses to both of these questions should be no longer than four pages, double space, total. That's for both of those questions, and it should be um, written in essay format, and you should make it clear which questions you are responding to separately. Okay, so moving on to fees. So this here in the chart um, is the cost for one year of the program. And these are um, these numbers here are based on 2020-21 amounts. The School of Graduate Studies will post the new tuition amounts in July. And it will roughly be around the same amount as you see here. Um, keep in mind, you don't have to pay for the entire year. You can pay per term, so at the start of the fall and start of the winter terms. And the Masters of Museum Studies is full-time only, so, um, so there's no part-time fee there. 
Um, so on to money matters. So students in professional master's programs, including the Masters of Museum Studies, typically fund their educational expenses through a variety of different programs. So here I've broken it down into three general categories. Financial aid is um, typically based on financial need. Awards and scholarships are typically merit-based. Some do require a separate application. And then employment on or off campus. So to start off with financial aid, most of our students do receive OSAP or some other form of government loan if you're outside of Ontario. And for students receiving OSAP, your financial need information will be sent to us directly. But for students receiving an out-of-province student loan, you will need to complete the out-of-province financial aid application form that can be found on our website under Money Matters to be eligible for other financial assistance. A PMFA is a grant and it attempts to fill a portion of the financial gap for full-time students who have received the maximum amount of government financial aid, but whose funding doesn't cover all of university um, costs. And so it's um, an attempt to, to try and uh, fill that gap and to help you cover, help cover the remaining of the cost. Um, emergency grants, so if you do encounter an unexpected emergency situation, um, I don't know, your house flooded, you lost your apartment, you can't pay for food or your amount's rent, um, you can apply for an emergency grant. Students with disabilities, um, so students with permanent disabilities may receive funds through the Canada Student Grant for persons with permanent disabilities as part of their OSAP funding. And then in addition to that, grants are also available through the Ontario Bursary for Students with Disabilities and the Canada Student Grant for Services and Equipment for Persons with Permanent Disabilities. And this will help with disability related supports and services. You may wish to apply for a line of credit. The University of Toronto has partnered with Scotiabank to provide a preferred interest rate to U of T students through the Scotia Professional Plan. Of course, you can apply for a line of credit with whichever financial institution you're most comfortable with, so you don't have to go with Scotiabank if you don't uh, want to. Um, uh, but that is just know that that is available as an option to you. So then awards and scholarships. Um, so we do have the automatic entrance awards. Um, that I've already spoken about. Um, again, your complete application, including references, need to be submitted by January 31st um, and you should have a minimum A minus average. But in addition to these automatic entrance awards, there are additional scholarships that can be found through the School of Graduate Studies website as well as the University of Toronto website that do require a separate application. Applicants can also apply for external government awards. So the OGS, the Ontario Graduate Scholarship, for example, um, is one scholarship that you can apply for. Um, just make sure you're looking into the deadlines now because that deadline is March 1st. Um, so you want to look into the application procedures for that now. Um, or the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, SHRC Award. Um, the amounts range from 15,000 to 17,500. So it's important to note, um, again, that these deadlines do typically happen earlier than the application deadline to the program. So SHRC, for example, the deadline was December 1st. So if you missed, apply if you missed applying for that now, for example, um, you can still apply for it in your first year of the program to receive funds for the second year of the program. And then there are other SGS for faculty awards, and these can include things like in-course um, in or current student scholarships, completion awards for when you graduate, travel and conference awards, or international student awards. And then finally, employment. Um, many of our students do work part-time while studying. The work study program is a great option. These are on-campus jobs and it's convenient because you're already on campus and can work between classes um, or whenever is convenient for you. The application will open in early August and we will let you know when they do become available for you to apply to. Um, and of course, any off-campus employment can be an option for you as well. Please have a look at our website for a general timeline on big ticket items that you should keep an eye on um, at different times throughout the year. We've created a, uh, a very detailed timeline for you there and you can um, find all the information that you need for applying for all the scholarships and awards that are available. So as I mentioned oops, at the start, um, 
If you're not comfortable asking questions uh, through this format, you can send us an email at admissions.ischool at utoronto.ca anytime, and I'm happy to answer your questions um, then. Um, feel free, again, as I mentioned, to continue to ask questions. I'm going to move on now to the careers uh, section of this presentation, um, but we do have other staff um, and students here who can help answer your questions throughout the presentation. So again, feel free to enter your questions through the chat field, um, and then I can also get to them at the end of the presentation. So moving on to career services. Okay. Oops. Uh, so the Career Services Office uh, jointly works to support students and their professional development, so the non-academic side of professional development, as well as our employee partners, our alumni relationships, and putting all those pieces together to help set students up for success. Here is a list of some of the services that we provide through our Career Services. So we offer one-on-one -on -one advising, our careers officer is available to help with resume, cover letter review, mock interviews. Um, they facilitate networking and alumni events, and they collaborate with our dedicated alumni officer for these events. We also host a series of workshops. So, for example, developing, developing a professional and personal narrative, sustainable networking, resume cover letter workshops to help you with articulating your skills when speaking with professionals. So the goal is to prepare you to network effectively and become embedded in your communities. So they do that through a combination of events, workshops, one-on-one -on -one advising, and so on. They also send out a weekly newsletter and send out um, opportunities as they do become available as well. We work closely with the Faculty of Information Alumni Association to help facilitate the Ask an Alum program as well as the Job Shadowing program. And you can participate in the Ask an Alum program right now as a prospective student. So you don't actually have to wait until you are admitted to the program or that you're a current student. So I recommend reaching out um, to the Ask an Alum program right now. It's a fillable form, Google form that you fill out on our website. Um, it says Ask an Alum <laughs> under the Alumni tab. So we do have a comprehensive list of alum who volunteer to speak to some of our students and you can ask them about career pathways, course recommendations, and so on. Career services also manage uh, the job site. So there's also a dedicated internship job site as well if you choose to pursue the internship option aside from the general external job site. So get, to get into a little bit more detail about the uh, museum studies internship, as a prerequisite to help you prepare for your internship, you will participate in the Emerging Professionals course. That's traditionally taken in the fall semester. So the way it works in the fall, you will use that time to identify your interests, build your interview skills, resume writing skills, develop your professional portfolio, which I'll talk about later. Um, and then in the winter, from January usually to early spring, is your active application stage for your internship. So that's um, when you can embark on that full time, so that you're able to embark on that internship full time in the summer. Traditionally, the internship pre-COVID uh, would take place 12 weeks over the summer. Of course, we know that our museum partners are impacted by the effects of the pandemic, and they're faced, um, they face some closures as well. Um, or had to move to a remote environment, um, similar to the rest of the world. So some of the changes um, that were made um, to the program um, is that you know, we reduced the number of weeks and hours required for the internship course, um, which is cre a credit bearing course. So instead of the 10 to 12 hours over the summer, it was reduced to eight weeks or 280 hours, which can be completed full time or part time. And it allowed students the opportunities to build that in, not only in the summer term, but in the fall and winter terms as well. We also offered additional courses over the summer for students who were not able to secure an internship. Internships can be paid or unpaid. Historically, approximately 60% are paid and about 40% are unpaid. Um, of course, this changes year to year. Um, for those that are unpaid, we do have some generous funding provided through the Rebanks and Campbell's family um, and provide students the opportunity to receive some funding. So the amount changes every year. It's approximately about $1,500 for students re uh, receiving unpaid internships, 
with organizations that are providing amazing experiential learning opportunities, but may not have the resources to provide a, pay, a paid opportunity. Historically, our students have traveled around the globe to complete their internship. This year, they were all completed remotely. Um, of course, in the future, we do hope to resume that travel portion as well. Okay. Um, professional development. So there, um, there are professional development opportunities outside of the internship. So on the left hand side, um, this is a portfolio development session. So I mentioned before the portfolio. Um, our partners from Haley Sharp Design came in last year to provide a really immersive portfolio development workshop and a follow up session with some of our students. They offered this opportunity again this year, and we selected a group of 20 students who applied to be part of this pathway. Um, you build your portfolios usually in November, and you have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with the staff from Haley Sharp Design to refine your portfolio and receive one-on-one -on -one feedback um, and mentor mentorship from them. So while a portfolio is not necessary, it is one of the ways that you're going to send out as an applicant and helps you articulate your skills in a creative way to help you connect with prospective employers and help you stand out. On the right hand side, this was an alumni panel event that we held in the summer to share experiences around the pandemic as well as career pathways um, and to share lived experiences, helping our students and recent graduates build graduates and build um, and reconnect with the community and have the opportunity to ask questions as well. So again, there are um, different professional development opportunities built into the program as well. Um, so this slide um, is just a small tasting of the 2020 internship job titles. You will see there is a bit of variety here. Uh, we did come up with contingency plans to ensure students still had the opportunity to participate in internship programs, um, this, the internship program this year, despite the closures. Um, again, this is a very small tasting of some of the um, opportunities that were available to our students this year. And then this slide um, are just some of the organizations um, that have and are participating with us. Some of them are just down the street, such as the ROM, um, but there are also different ones around the city of Toronto and across the country as well. Here is some information about our alum. More data can be found on our careers outcome page. So if you go to careers and then careers outcome, outcomes tab, you'll be able to see um, more information. This particular project um, looks at the data collected from early 1970s to 2018 to learn where our museum studies alum have gone. So as you can see, many of our alum do work within a museum um, institution or in a museum related job. But there is a wider variety of other opportunities um, like so for example, like different within um, the GLAM organizations. GLAM stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. This may be of a, uh, special interest to those maybe interested in our CDB, CDP, Combined Degree Program option. Um, this is just such an impressive survey, and, and I'm continually impressed by our museum studies students and the diversity of skills that they, they develop and the areas that they're able to get into because of those diverse skills. And then this slide um, just gives you a breakdown of where some of our alum have gone to work. So as you can see, it's not always a linear path. There is a diversity of opportunities available. So keep an open mind. Speak with our alum, speak with professionals in the field, and discover for yourself where your passions lie and what skills you need to build with our help um, to help get you where you want to go. And that's it for this session. Um, so now I'm going to open it up to you if you do have any questions for us. Um, again, we do have our assistant dean here as well who can help answer any questions that you have. Um, and then again, immediately following this session, we are going to have our MMST program overview by Professor Costas Dallas. Um, and again, some of our students who are going to uh, chat with you as well.
Um, but in the meantime, if you do have any admissions or career related questions, uh, please feel free to um, start asking. I don't think any came in. Oh, great. Hi, Wendy. And this is, oh, looks like Caesar has a question. This is actually Stephanie Rose, our assistant dean, registrar on student services. Caesar, if you want to go ahead and actually uh, type the question into the chat, we'd be happy to answer the question. I just wanted to welcome you all and definitely um, just share a few things that I would say during the museum, during the pandemic, I think our museum study students have had tremendous opportunity to look to probably global opportunities that have, have actually expanded as far as educational and collaborative opportunities simply because institutions around the world such as the art gallery of ontario and and again many many around the world have been able to provide online programming curatorial conversations collections and really thinking i'd say outside of the traditional approaches that they've been doing and also being really proactive in identifying ways in which the museum field is probably changing, growing, and emerging somewhat for the better, somewhat for coping during a pandemic. And so I think all of those things are quite amazing. And even in a pandemic where we hear, you know, about museum closures as far as the doors not being open, I think we're seeing access to, to content within our world-class museums here in Toronto and around the world uh, being more accessible because of that ingenuity and creativity. So for those of you on the call today who are those kinds of professionals really looking for those opportunities to spread your wings, take museums where they are from today and have them emerge into the museums of the future, I think you couldn't be better poised to be going through a graduate program that will give you the sense of tradition, sense of uh, history, but also that sense of fighting spirit and creativity and, and um, really thinking through in times of challenge how institutions are recreating themselves. So I think that part's fascinating when we look at the program at this time. I'm seeing that our chat actually looks to be turned off so we can make sure that within our moderator information, we are able to do that. Uh, so people who do have questions, there we go. I'll click that button so that should enable students now, hopefully, and attendees to post chats besides just me. Okay. Yay. Okay, excellent. Hopefully, yes. Great. So, Caesar, we see that you've typed in there. Feel free to post a question. Oh, the comment. <laughs> Other thoughts, questions, comments? We know we have a full day of programming coming up for those of you who may be attending the program overview as well as the campus tour. We also have our double blue information session. So uh, that's a piece of it as well, that if you're at all uh, interested in understanding opportunities for those of you who've graduated already from the U of T system and would like to apply to a second degree from University of Toronto, that session's at 1145. And from there, we have the other program information as well. Yes, so the question about, I would like to know if the scholarship includes the double blue program with Masters of Information and Museum Studies. Absolutely. Anyone applying to any of our graduate programs is eligible automatically for the double blue program. And so whether it's Museum Studies or Masters of Information, absolutely you will be considered assuming you follow through the requirements outlined in the double blue session. Do we offer delayed enrollment? I'm going to come back. I'll let, um, I'll let, uh, for Austin's question, I'll let Andrea answer that. For Kelly, though, do you offer delayed enrollment or do students who spend years off, or do students who spend years off not in a relevant field face any issues? 
So absolutely, Callie, we have numerous students that are not coming directly out of undergraduate. We have, uh, as we've mentioned, with that holistic approach to our admissions component, really what we're looking for is a combination of things. We don't want every student to be a cookie cutter of everyone else. We really respect those of you who have been out in the work field, have learned about your own likes and dislikes, strengths and weaknesses. We want to hear what you bring as a professional, as an individual, as a learner, as a, as a human to the program. And again, we do not want everyone to just be straight out of undergrad. We want people with, say, life skills, life experiences, academic experiences, and professional experiences. So by no means do we see that that would face any issues in the application round. And actually, I would say some of our strongest students in all of our programs do tend to be those who have maybe taken a break, assess where they want to go personally and professionally, and then apply to school a little bit uh, later on in the process. And then just to answer some of the questions that have come in um, regarding the internship. Um, so no, the internship doesn't happen in your first semester of the first year. It actually happens um, in the summer. So between your first and second year is when the internship will take place place. So within the fall and winter of your internship, you're going to uh, basically prepare, uh, develop the skills. Um, so, you know, your resume um, writing skills, your mock interview skills, and prepare um, for the application process for um, the internship positions. Um, and then the winter is your active application period. So that's when you're going to start, um, you know, actively looking for positions to apply to. Um, and then the summer is when the internship would actually start. So the summer between your first and second year. Um, so then in terms of the additional application requirements for um, the internship, um, yes, there are, um, there's the emergence, uh, sorry, emerging professionals course that you are required to take in the fall um, to be eligible for the internship program. Um, for the cost, is it twelve thousand uh, for that's twelve thousand for one year? So the program is two years, um, and so it'll be roughly around the same for your second year as well. Um, so that's the cost um, for the entire year. Um, summer is an optional term; um, you're not paying any extra if you choose to take courses over the summer term. Um, and you are able to pay per term rather than the entire year, so you can pay half of it um, in the fall and then the other half in the winter. Caesar, I'm not necessarily sure I know what you mean by accompaniment for international students. Is that related to finances or scholarships or opportunities? Finances. So we actually have had long, long conversations the past couple of years related to finances for international students and applicants simply because we do know it's, uh, it's obviously more expensive if you're international. If you understand the model in which our, because we are a large public institution and a big percentage of the funding from the, um, the institution comes from government donations, so citizens of the country, that's, that's kind of reflective as to why there is quite a substantial difference in the tuition amounts. So um, when we, of course, recognize those things, we do, as a faculty, we have been trying to look at other opportunities to assist in financing uh, international student applications, and we have talked about opportunities for employment even on campus or at other institutions in the area. We also have identified some scholarship money here and there to expand in opportunities specifically uh, around admission awards. Um, but quite honestly, with reaching out far and wide, even on our own campus around international um, finances, there was not a lot of centralized financing that we were able to secure specifically in regards to say scholarships for our international students, unfortunately. Callie asks about guaranteed an internship between first and second year. If I understand correctly, and please Andrea jump in if, if this isn't correct, um, usually I believe we have more internships available in a typical year, this last year a little bit different of course, but generally we have more internships available and we have students. And so you may not be guaranteed like, you know, big places like the AGO or the ROM, especially here in Toronto are those big names. And, and we do have a very competitive process in regards to those positions. 
So yes, we do have um, oppor opportunities available as far as being guaranteed. It, it's not going to be guaranteed at maybe your number one choice. And so looking at all kinds of opportunities and options, if you're willing to be outside of the Toronto area, uh, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities all over Canada. Again, if you're, let's say, in the US or far flung, say, in other parts of the world, there are definitely opportunities there as well. So yeah, I would say we can't guarantee that you'd get your first choice, but I would say usually there's a, a large number of opportunities available for placements and internships uh, all over yeah. Canada for sure. Yeah. Can I jump in? Hi. This Please. Is Wendy. Well, this is Wendy and I'm the Dean. Um, I would say that um, the other thing is that we have, uh, there are, there is funding for internships. It is, uh, they've come through donations. So normally, um, there are certainly paid internships out there. We don't guarantee a paid internship. And the amount of money that you get from the, the fellowship, if you take an unpaid uh, internship, is not a lot. It's about what I think I heard someone say about 1500 1500 yeah. Yeah. So in, in normal years, in normal years, um, you know, you can find a museum that is more than happy to have someone come and work and if when they don't have to pay. Um, but it is not that. Um, but there is a big difference, as, as Steph has already said, you know, there's some super popular ones who doesn't want to work at the Smithsonian, myself included. Um, and certainly paid internships are more popular than unpaid internships, but there is funding uh, within the faculty and in normal years, everyone has them. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, thanks oh, for jumping. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm actually just going to um, end this session because our next session is actually just about to start. So it is the um, Museum Studies Program overview, overview session. Um, it is taking place in another room. So um, if you head back into the lobby of the events um, and just click on MI Program Overview, you will be able to enter um, into that session and we will see you there in a few seconds. <laughs>